Hello everyone, um, Katerina Newbury here from Minecraft Peace Podcast. It is my great pleasure to welcome Lorraine Murray as my next guest uh, for this episode of podcast. Hello Lorraine. Hello Katerina. Hello, how are you today? I'm glad I'm here, looking forward to this. Yes, we're going to have a lovely conversation. Um, I'm just going to briefly introduce Lorraine because I'm so pleased she's um, agreed to be my guest. I, she's been a great inspiration to me, and you'll find out all about it in a in a moment. Um, so Lorraine is the founder and CEO of Connected Kids, um, um, a program. Uh, for children and, and adults who want to teach children meditation. It's been in existence for over 20 years now. Um, Lorraine is also um, a foster mom and adoptive parent now as well, if I understand correctly. No, just foster. Still, no, still foster. Yeah, okay, still, still it feels foster. feels like that sometimes. But yeah, it does, definitely. doesn't it? That's yeah, why I thought, does, yeah. And Lorraine is the person... Um, who inspired me to um, gain um, a genuine qualification in teaching children and young people mindfulness and meditation. Um, I She's an author of two books. They're both here with me, along with lots of bookmarks. <laughs> and um, today we're going to have a conversation that will circle around mindfulness and meditation for the young people and for parents as a as a real tool for for life and the world we live in right now. And I just before we dive in, um, I was um, reading this beautiful quote that is on top of your your website um, in preparation for our conversation by the. Uh, the head teacher of the first school, I believe, you went into to deliver uh, meditation to children. And I love that you called it a mindful revolution for future generations, because it really feels like that. Um, and it's a reflection of the capacity we all have to find kind of you know, peace and stillness within ourselves. But we'll we'll get to that in a in a moment. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add to the introduction? No, it's perfect. Wonderful. Okay, so I guess my first question would be to those who may have some idea of meditation, what meditation is, what what mindfulness is, what how would you describe meditation and what it is to you? I think, or I feel, depends, um, I think meditation is personal. I mm -hmm. think that's the most important thing. I think as soon as we start to define it, as soon as we start to give explanations of it, we have to understand that there are different interpretations of that word and different experiences of that word. And that was one of the things I came across when, you know, our first propose that we talk children this um i guess many people weren't doing that i think people were under the illusion that meditation was only for adults and children couldn't do it because they just have too much energy it's possible mm. um so we had to almost redefine our approach to meditation and how we practice it and how we teach it and i think you know, all these children that we've taught either me directly or indirectly through people we've trained um, have taught me that meditation is personal. Mm. It's really, really personal. And it's not a one size fits all. That's the way I would sum up meditation. I love that. It's the word experience that jumps out for me because it is meditation takes us on, on journeys that are very, like you describe, personal. Um, and there are so many ways that they can be introduced to children and young people that make them personal to them and, and engaging for them. And that's been one of the things that I really enjoyed about con the Connected Kids program. So I guess um, there's, you know, mindfulness is a, a little bit of a buzzword right now. It's kind of recognized. I think people have some awareness of what mindfulness is like, I guess, a bit like yoga 
20 years ago when people started to have an idea of what, what yoga is and now you know you say you go to yoga and everyone's like yeah 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 so I think that's where we are heading um with mindfulness and meditation um as well um how would you say how would you describe the connected kids program to those who maybe have some idea of what mindfulness is that's I think first half of the question and the other half of the question is how does it differ to what you would maybe see the off-the-shelf mindfulness programs that maybe are now taught at at schools yeah well, I think there's different entry points for people in terms of their experience of meditation and trying to teach it to kids. And I think what we curated and crafted over the years, and again, it's back to the children that we taught that helped us do this, is that we we try to meet children where they're at. Yeah. So it, it, somebody used the term child-centred, that's seems to be what educators and the medical profession might use, uh, health profession. But, you know, that was basically it means we meet children where they're at. So in other words, we're not trying to uh, enforce meditation. We're not trying to make them do something that we think is good for them. We're trying to create a connection for them to meditation that appeals to them. And that could appeal to them because of the more dynamic nature of the practice, or it could appeal to them because of the theme of the practice. Um, and that's a revelation usually for the adults who come on the mm. program, because they tend to, even if they've meditated for a long time, there is often the interpretation and attitude that this is how you meditate, this is true meditation, this is the real meditation. And what children actually teach us is that mm, I can't do it like that. So how can you teach me that accommodates my needs? And that's where I think the beauty of what we do comes in because, and it's not to say that, you know, your child is going to consistently meditate all the time. What you're doing is you're giving them the skills to give them the choice. If you don't teach them the skills, they have no choice. They rely mm. on other methods that are not always that successful or they will struggle to you know accommodate their behavior their interpretation of life the use of technology in their life that's really demanding of them they'll do their best to survive but if you give them these tools and the way that they can access and understand for their age and stage then they're going to this i call it planting a seed you plant a seed with mm. them and it's up to them really personally to um to use that particular practice or sometimes even to teach it to other people when they can see them struggling which i've often happens with the children that we've taught and i think the the you know i used to feel quite concerned i would be really honest about the off the shelf mm. the, you know packages ideas that you mentioned there but i think there's different entry levels you yeah. know i think that for some people whose interpretation of meditation, who thinks, oh, that sounds like a lot of hard work, Lorraine, I'm not sure I've got time for that. You know, I just want something quick I can just do quickly. I call that first aid meditation normally. Or emergency <laughs> meditation. Um, and that's true. You will be able to pull those things off the shelf and use them quickly and they will be effective. But it's when we try to consistently use the same thing over and over and over again that children find that less appealing and in some ways we have to just be a little bit more playful mindful creative with that mm. and that's what keeps them connected to it and I don't think other programs necessarily do that I think they start people off they start the conversation yeah. they introduce some techniques I think it's great but to keep a young person you know consistently interested and engaged means that we can't just stand still and go, yeah, do that again, do that again, do that again. We have to say, okay, have you thought about it? Try it this way. And for anyone who's listening who practiced meditation a long time, usually when I'm teaching, this is what I say to students. When you go into your meditation practice, you may have a structure, you may have, I start with breath or I sit this way or whatever, but you 
don't have the same experience each time. Yeah. You'll have different thoughts and feelings. Some days will be easier or more difficult than others. And that's personal to you. And that's the process. So why should that be different when we're teaching meditation? Mm. Why do we expect to do the same thing each time? And for it to never change, that's impossible. We have to be fluid, flowing yeah. with it in the way that we are in our own practice. Beautiful. And it taps, this approach taps into what children bring to, to us adults and, and the, the adult world, which is uh, playfulness, spontaneity, um, creativity, imagination, all, all of that we can use and they the other way teach us we learn from them <laughs> to incorporate all of that in our lives I find it incredibly enriching um, working with children they are um, constantly learning um, and it's one of those things where like you said and I love that phrase I use it myself planting seeds that you obviously you need to kind of look after them you have to nurture them for them to kind of grow and the fact that they didn't grow straight away doesn't mean that they're not gonna kind of you know few months few years down the line kind of pick up and and that takes a it takes a little bit of I guess um what's the bird what's the word I'm patience. looking for patience absolutely but a little bit of um be humble about it. Our our profession, if you like, our our job is to and then place trust in in the children as well, or the the adults that they they work with live with. Um, that yeah, this is still it's still the right thing to do that's going to work for them. Mm. There's something else. So this is maybe I'll come back to why I joined your program. So I had I had this book well before I uh, joined your program. And I I felt I would like to do a course of some sort. I, I was doing a lot um, just kind of self-taught, but I felt, yeah, it was time. But I just couldn't find a, a program that would just kind of sit, feel, you know, feel right with me, sit right with me. There was something about the approach that um, always seemed either too prescriptive or too to set around the the mindfulness and the kind of the mindset um and then your program when you started talking about engaging the heart coming from the heart center and uh you know be um yeah tuning into the the needs of the child I was like bingo this is it this is the program for me and yeah it's taken me on a wonderful journey and I'm you know still learning every day even now I think it's going to be two years since I completed yeah and um yeah, so perhaps for people who probably have no idea what I'm talking about <laughs> what would you say how would you describe to them what is a you know heart-centered approach what does it mean to work from the the heart space with children I think well it depends Again, there's different ways of answering that question. You know, for someone who's maybe unfamiliar with meditation and maybe energy systems, you might you could say it's unconditional. You know, it's an mm. unconditional approach to this. It's it's a an approach where you have good intentions for that young person. It's the whole reason you want to teach them. You see them struggle. You want to you feel in your capacity as a parent or carer or teacher, whoever it is. You want to help them because you you don't we none of us like to see anyone struggle, particularly young people. So when you uh, are working from the heart, you're you're not trying to control them. You're trying mm. to offer them skills and practices and recognize that it is their choice to engage with them or not. And so, but when you work from the heart, there's a there's a that unconditional nature of it usually sets the the I suppose the atmosphere with children where they feel more comfortable accepting it because it's unconditional it, I suppose it empowers them because they think or they feel they have a choice so there's that aspect of it for those people who do practice meditation a lot and have quite a lot of awareness about an energy system it's thousands of years old the, the chakra system that comes it's very involved in the Ayurvedic yogic practices 
Um, so people who practice yoga, you're working your chakras. Um, so the heart center is this, it's almost like a midway point between the internal and the external worlds. So you have this, um, I want to call it a gateway to a flow of energy that I suppose connects to bigger purpose. Why are we here? What's life all about? Mm. You know, and when we, but when we work from that place within our energy system, it's like our personality and our identity doesn't control, doesn't take over. And we, we have a sense of awe and curiosity about the experiences we're having. And so for me, you know, if you were, if you're into gardening, you notice the geometric patterns and the colors of flowers or plants, or if you're looking at a particularly beautiful sunset or sunrise, you know, those moments of awe are heart-centered moments because they are beyond the logic of the mind. They're not about your life and how, you know, it's just that moment of like, of connection that you think, my goodness, this is incredible. And then your mind will rush in to make sense of it and understand it and process it and file it away. But in that moment, the heart is just really open to the experience and just, um, is aware and of course in our society we use words like love but it's it's not a it's not a packaged item it's a flow of energy and i think when we teach meditation from that space we become this beautiful channel of um aligned energy that connects into our words and the children's energy which needs that healing and alignment respond positively to it and I think that's why when we're training people to, particularly those that are on the spectrum or have trauma, all our tutors, you know, that we are helping them stay very heart centered with them. That's why we get such a positive and powerful response mm. from children on the spectrum, because they have that, they can really feel energy in a way that we have absolutely no idea about. Mm. And here we are, this human being comes into their world. Yes, we have this meditation teacher title, but really they're like, wow, I can feel that this, your energy, this is amazing. I like this. And <laughs> they want to stay and they want to participate. And they, mm. the, the stress they've been feeling being the person that they are reduces. And that, that's the stress that's contributing to the behavior, you know, and the anxiety and the, you know, the difficulties and the struggle that you witness. When you start to bring that down, they're still the same person with autism, but they're just not having to behave that way because they don't feel the stress and anxiety anymore. Mm. I love that. And you've kind of answered my next next question, <laughs> which was about um, another reason why I was drawn to Connected Kids was the fact that you've um, introduced meditation to children that are neurodivergent um, on the autism spectrum or um, ADHD and that you just out of curiosity initially actually then realized that it's incredibly helpful and you've just beautifully described that it is um, because we come from the center of the heart and bring in this unconditional energy if you like um and I, I was drawn to working with children on, on the spectrum, even though my, my own children, they're sensitive, my, my sons, but I wouldn't think they'd pass any, any di you know, diagnosis. Um, but it matters too much. And that's what I think a cornerstone of your program is. Well, it matters so much um, how I am what my energy is like, how I come in into this session, how I am within myself, you know, physically, emotionally, energetically, so that I can then provide the the space, the the environment, and yeah, the, the space to be able to to share meditation with them. And, it, and if anything else, and I I remind myself of that a lot in session. It's um and I wonder maybe you, you can comment on that. That the if you like the the criteria for success of a session or a meditation is not necessarily how engaged the child was with what I kind of bring in as an as an activity but the time spent together in 
in that in that you know unconditional <laughs> um accepting loving environment um would you would you agree what what would you yes totally say and i think again it's that sense of our interpretation of what meditation should look like mm. is oh well it's a still seated practice for some children that's absolutely impossible and if we have that expectation of them we'll then judge the situation and them saying they can't meditate this isn't working yeah. whereas actually as you've just described when we come into that space and we sit with curiosity and wonder and go oh, look at that they can't sit still isn't that interesting mm. which is what i had to do because no one i you know i was teaching adults meditation but i had never taught kids meditation i was like that's just that you know is this working maybe it's not working and then i would get feedback from the children and they would be the way they described their experiences. I was like, "This, the, you are having some positive effect from this. So why are you not sitting still?" Is this what I was asking myself? Why are you not sitting still? And then it was just that multiple times of experiencing that, realizing that for some children, that movement is them needing to ground their energy. That's how they stabilize. And if I enforce a stillness. That would be so counterintuitive to yeah. their needs. So actually the movement, just allowing them to have more mindful movement even sometimes, you know, in that space is enough for them to, but, but bringing that more mindful meditative aspect of what they're doing and offering them the chance to tune into that if they want to. And you're right, it's, it's very much about, you know, my view is that if you're teaching children meditation and it seems like they're not paying attention or not, you know, but they're there and you're, you're aware of your energy and you're working with that as they're there. If they stay in the room, something is happening. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're privy to what that might be. Um, but if they leave the room, they've had enough. They don't need, you know, they don't need any more. That's it. Or it's not the approach you're bringing might be a little bit of, ego expectation they're like oh that feels uncomfortable i have to leave here or so. just trying to make it happen manipulating it yeah, yeah yeah and i don't i don't sit in judgment of people you know because i am very aware of i think when it's your own children um there's a different dynamic goes on with your own children even although it's my foster son there's a different dynamic goes on mm. you know um but nevertheless something still can take place something can still you know support your journey together and it isn't just you teaching them it's them teaching you yeah. that's the that's the biggest one for me so I guess um for people who are now kind of intrigued by <laughs> our conversation about supporting children and young people on the, on the spectrum of neurodivergent brains Shall we share some examples of how meditation can support them um, from your experience? Would you would you share anything, examples of where meditation has helped or supported? I think it gives maybe. them, yeah, I think it gives them, a, well, first of all, and pri primarily, it helps the, under, the adults understand them better. Mm. And it helps the adults, you know, I think there's, particularly when children are diagnosed or in the cusp of being diagnosed as being on the spectrum I think there's a lot of fear a lot of anxiety in parents understandably you know there's catastrophizing mm. you know what's going to happen to them are they going to be okay how are they going to live a, nor a normal life whatever that is and um and so and energetically speaking children can feel that they can feel the anxiety the emotions that we're having about that so the more we if we think oh they don't know what we're feeling yes they do absolutely so that's very difficult for them to be around someone who's quite tense that way how they, they sense energy so um i think it brings understanding when you start to learn about how to be more mindful and curious and aware it gives it brings a level of understanding and then what happens is that your interpretation of how they're trying to cope re is reframed. So mm. you understand why they have certain behaviours or you understand why certain things trigger them. And so you then start to bring in more creative tools that, you know, 
the logical head might say, well, that doesn't seem very meditation-like or very calming, but it seems counterintuitive, but it's actually what that child needs. And the ultimate you know, proof of that is the response of the child. So to give you an example, um, I remember I had a, a student in my class when I taught in London and uh, she came on. We had two, we have two stages. We have foundation and professional stage, but the professional incorporates foundation anyway. And she was on the whole thing. So no, she wasn't. She was only on the foundation. She was a mum. She was a policewoman. Um, and she had a young boy who was maybe three or four who was displaying autistic behaviours. And at that stage, they didn't have a diagnosis, but it was a real struggle. And so um, I was teaching her how to learn about meditation, what it was. I mean, I'm going to say, and no offence to any police people in the police, but the way you're trained to interpret the world is very logical and very factual and very structured. So to come on a meditation course or teaching meditation course is quite a courageous step because it's really taking you out of your comfort zone. But she was there and she was learning how to, what it meant, the benefits. Um, we were walking them through how to start to create meditations, you know, how to create the, and be aware of how we use words and deliver them and so on. And um, yeah, everybody, you know, gets the chance to deliver a little, a little bit of meditation to the group in these particular sessions. So I didn't really think anything more of it. And then a few months later, she came on the second part to the professional. And she said, oh, do you remember I was on the course? I went, yeah, I do actually. And she went, well, I went back home and she said, I, um, I had this meditation that I felt I was to teach my son. It was a jungle meditation. So a jungle meditation, it's animals, noisy smells, you know, and that was the environment. And she said, it was quite a dynamic one. And it was before bedtime. <laughs> she said, I was thinking, oh, should I really be teaching this at this time? But she thought, okay, trust think. Lorraine has been saying, trust, just go with your instincts, trust, you know. And she says, I taught him this and he loved it. But she said, the biggest thing for me was one of the difficulties he's had is making any eye contact with us. It was the first time he made eye contact with me. And I was like, oh my wow. goodness. So yeah, that's amazing. I feel even, I can feel emotion rising mm -hmm. when I'm telling you that. And it was like, you know, this, this really courageous mom who really was out of comfort zone with the whole concept of meditation, but was really struggling and didn't know how to help her son had learned something and oh you know she'd overridden all her logic to teach him this to have that experience and therefore she wanted to learn many more tools to take to him so that she could help him you know be the best version of himself basically he he was diagnosed with autism after that mm. but it was like you know and i guess that's the that's the difference i think you can have that experience another experience i had which was directly with me i'll never forget this and um, i was really quite new at teaching children meditation they were my lovely guinea pigs i have to say and um this boy the was in a session with me there was a group of them the head teacher decided to sit in on this session and after i did done a colour meditation actually with them and then I'd done a little bit of guided a little bit of a visualisation with them and then when we came you know when they kind of all eyes were open I asked them all you know each one one by one what their journey had been like and so as I went around the group and this boy told me this colour it was this colour actually the colour blue <laughs> and then he proceeded to um, tell me about his journey I didn't think anything more of it. I moved on to the next child. And then after the session, the head teacher pulled me aside and said, that boy that spoke up, she said, his life is so full of trauma that we actually, he basically lives like, fer like a, a feral cat on the street. She says he's really, she says he has a difficult, difficult life. And more importantly, he never speaks to anyone. He never uses his voice. And here he was after one meditation session and for anyone listening who is unfamiliar with the color blue it connects to the throat center it's the color of the throat chakra and i was just like oh my goodness this is healing this is extraordinary 
you know mm -hmm. this is really important so yeah it was really a powerful lesson for me you know and, and realizing and treating this with reverence you know treating this with mm -hmm. love and kindness and reverence and um, very effective it could be for children in the most extreme circumstances mm. that's that's so powerful question just popped to my head if i were a parent my child is struggling and you know what normally uh, emotionally struggling um i think for most people um the first thought would be well let's find him a therapist let's find a psychotherapist or you know um go to a mental health service organization what would you say to them um about you know what we do and uh, what connected kids can provide how can they help the children and um you know why would should they maybe consider reaching out to a tutor um not as opposed to but as maybe as well as uh, um uh, as a therapist what 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 is it that we can pro provide or yeah for for their child I do I do get a lot of psychologists and psychiatrists taking mm. the course and adding it mm. to their skill base which is really good and it totally changes their practice actually I've had many people <laughs> come back and tell me that um I think that I think I suppose that you really need to that you have you're a parent you have concern you see behaviors you don't understand that makes you mm. feel vulnerable it makes you feel I'm just putting these words out inadequate out of control you know the parents feeling mm. that because they can't help they can't they can't find a way to help this young person and what they see or experience are behaviors that is a cry for help really you know it's communication behaviors mm. like that that's saying i'm struggling please help me and i think that it's important to you know first of all the connected kids tutors unless they have a background in psychology or counseling they are not qualified to diagnose. That's not what this is about. Mm. But what they can do is, um, I suppose, have a sense of, if you meet a young person, you're not, you, you come in so objectively because you're not, you don't have any hidden agenda. You're not there to fix them. You're almost tuning into them and it's like your heart center is listening to their heart center. So you're hearing them on a level that's different, that they can't even articulate in words, but you you have a sense of, I wonder if we should try this. This might, And this is the thing that we teach all our tutors when they work from this place, they can't cause any harm. That's the, ultimately, because you're not mm. trying to control or you don't have an agenda. You're, you're actually... It's like a radio signal you're tuning into and you're sensing this might, this feels right for this young person. Let's try this. And the young person likes that. And it creates this lovely connection of trust. And, um, you know, that young person then starts to engage with some of the practices and they notice they feel better, you know. And mm -hmm. the parents are like, oh, my goodness, they're sleeping better and their behavior was better. And, you know, um, so... I think that's what connected kids tutors and it might be the the young person does have to get a diagnosis and does have to meet a psychologist which I can only imagine depending on their age and stage is quite a daunting scary experience mm. in itself but what the the tutor the connected kids tutor has done is give them some tools to use when they're feeling anxiety and stress and so no matter what experience whether it's a new school a new class mm a new teacher, a psychologist appointment, a dentist appointment, you know, you've given them some tools for them to pick and choose from that says, I do this when I notice this happening in me. And that's up to them, you know, yeah. and that's really empowering for them to be able to do that. The same, you know, if they're in the house and I mean, family life is family life. Everybody argues, <laughs> you know, that happens. But again, if, you know, a child is feeling anxious because of what they hear, or witness, even the things they see on the news, they can use these tools for themselves to self-regulate, to learn mm -hmm. self-regulation and not, you know, um, go into survival mode. Yeah. What they're experiencing. 
it's having the tools that is so empowering but i think before that happens is what we i hope we bring is the initial awareness because i think uh you know children as well as our adults can go through kind of life just not even realizing this is going on for me you know we're so much in our heads um also so much focus on the external world that we kind of are well not not aware or in denial of what what goes on on the inside and i i love meditation mindfulness also is for the fact that unlike the majority of the world right now where you you seek answers and solutions in the external world this is something that's available to all of us and actually turns the attention inward that will be perfect for us and it help you know um helps us to build trust self confidence you know having you know being first being aware and then having tools to help ourselves i think it's like the greatest the greatest gift um so yeah that's truly empowering i'm just I'm conscious of the time and want to be respectful of your of your time Lorraine as well um so connected kids have been going for over 20 years you've helped so many adults to learn to teach mindfulness and meditation all over the world I just saw your map on the website it is literally dots dots everywhere from South Africa to to America Asia you 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 name it um and you set up connected kids because there wasn't anything like this out there you couldn't go to learn how to teach meditation to to children so you went and <laughs> set up connected kids yourself so obviously there's a lot more awareness about mental health like we've touched upon mindfulness becoming kind of more of a word that people have idea of what it is um obviously with everything they're going on mental health and emotional well-being is becoming a to be at the forefront of kind of focus of you know the society but um i have this um kind of belief that the children that are in the world now um are different they they see more more attuned uh, with with themselves more attuned to energy more sensitive to kind of um, any any injustices or evils that kind of happen in the world and they may you know they obviously react to that um so i'm really excited about the work that that we do um but if you look at where connected kids as a program is now and the way it's helping children and adults now where do you see it, say, maybe, I know, 15, 20 years time? Um, just curious. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm in shock that, you know, we're even here after 20 years. I can't believe it's been 20 years. You know, it's <laughs> like, it's really quite bizarre. Um, I just, I suppose my biggest intention is that children have access to someone talking about learning from teaching them some uh, let's call them well yeah I'm just going to call them meditation practices so that at least the it's a familiar word you know it's a word yeah. that doesn't make people roll their eyes or you know think has any religious you know mm. connection it's just it is a it's as normal as brushing your teeth you know it's a it's something that we do and we do it because we we accept that self-care is the best form of care you know mm. it's the most proactive self-care um that's where i would like to see that and i think in terms of connected kids it's difficult for me to say because I do really follow the universal breadcrumbs of <laughs> life you know I that my biggest wish is that it's available to all children everywhere and I suppose my second wish is that as adults we learn to we allow ourselves to learn from our children rather than 
staying in our heads thinking we need to teach them things you know yeah. so i almost would like you know can imagine a school day where well, i hope school systems change as well for that matter, <laughs> yeah. but you know imagine a school day where children learn these skills and maybe their crusty old parents are unfamiliar with them but part of their homework is to go home and teach their adults around mm. them some mindful skills so actually it's not the adults teaching children anymore it's the children teaching adults and that would be very interesting because that wow. then, you know that that is really empowering a young person to shape the future for themselves and everyone else in it I love that. I envision, yeah, school's going to look very different, absolutely, in 20 years. I must do, there's no other way. But also that meditation and mindfulness is part of it. It's just woven through the day. It just becomes like part of the, part of life, basically. Yeah, it starts of the day, starts of the lesson. And then, yeah, amazing. On top of that, they would go home and then, teach their adults, teach their parents and carers. Mm -hmm. Oh, looking forward but, to that. <laughs> I just I, I just want to put a caveat in there, though. Mm. I would like it to be that there is the freedom to choose. Yes. That. You know, yes. I don't want, I don't envisage like, you know, in corporates in some parts of the world where people have to stand up and sing the corporate song. <sighs> <laughs> it's just really, another tick I, box isn't it yeah, yeah i don't really i don't really think I, I mean it still will have some positive effect but ideally it's because they genuinely feel the benefit of it that's why you do it the more you recognize that for themselves the more you go yeah this feels good i'm going to do more of this absolutely that that would take us into a, a whole new conversation on like how the teacher child kind of dynamic can work and how to really kind of engage them that 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 has not a hint of control or, or manipulation but that would be for a whole different conversation <laughs> um is there anything you would like to share with those who would like to learn to teach meditation or just learn meditation for themselves or help their children what is there anything you'd like to share with them before we we finish i mean i think do your research you know and mm -hmm. or just even if you're thinking i'm too busy to do research lorraine then just just if someone has a it happens to mention something a book or a course you know if you happen to be here listening to this podcast you know go and have a look and see if it feels right to you mm -hmm. and there's a lot of free things now available so don't yeah. feel that you know economy is the barrier to accessing this mm. yes of course there's different levels and there's different you know quantities of like you were saying you know to become qualified but even if you start off with the basics just practice that and see what happens and and don't give yourself a hard time if you think it didn't work. I mean, to, to finish with, you know, my foster son has been with us for five years and I can count on one hand how many times I've taught him meditation. And you might be thinking, what? Why would you not teach him all the time? Because he doesn't want to learn all the time. And I have to respect that. So, but I have incorporated, yeah, he's taught me actually how to introduce it to him in a way that's accessible, whether that's an explanation of how to help his mind in a more mm. calming way, whether that's sending it to him on WhatsApp because he like, prefers that than sitting with me learning meditation. You know, I, so being more creative that way. And I know that, you know, the breathing techniques and the things I have introduced to him, he's gone on to share with some of his peers. And it's like, mm -hmm. there we go then. If you're actually sharing that with, you know, someone else, I'm happy with that. Because That's so positive. Yes, it is. I love that. And and so don't don't look for them wearing a t-shirt saying, I love meditation. <laughs> <laughs> they might be doing it surreptitiously, you know, you have absolutely mm. no idea. It's private to them, you know. Yeah. Don't force it down their throats. Just but you practice if you feel the need to force them to do it, you practice meditation. You need it more than them. Mm. Well, I personally recommend your books. I mean, um, and we also, I don't know if you're planning to, but we have done um 
uh, challenges, free five day challenges that have been an amazing, I think, kick kickstart for people as well. So when we do it, uh, we'll let you know. Um, Thank you so much, Lorraine. Thank you for your time and sharing all of the things about Connected Kids and how, how you help parents and carers and, and young people to yeah, feel better and more connected. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Katerina. <laughs> I appreciate the time for people to hear about this and to plant a seed with you. You know, yeah. that there is an opportunity for you to explore something more. Thank you so much for tuning in, for listening, for watching. And um, it's been Lorraine, Murray and Katerina Newbury. Thank you and have a great rest of the day. Bye for now. Bye. <laughs>